Turn with us over the book of Galatians this morning and uh, let the Lord just minister to us here in this word today. The book of Galatians, Paul is trying to rescue uh, the Galatians. Uh, they have been having some influences about going back into the Mosaic law, go back to the law, go back to, and the law represents flesh. We know that, the Old Testament. And so you can bring it to today, and Paul is trying to rescue them from going back to fleshly ways, going back to the world. Amen? I mean, we understand from Genesis to Malachi, you can't go to heaven. So you understand if you're led by the flesh, you're not going. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, it tells us. In fact, Paul says in Galatians 1 and 6, he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. He said, it blows my mind when I see people that comes to Christ and starts a good walk with the Lord and a good testimony and end up slowly drifting back into the world and it does it just slowly eases back in fact he says in, in Galatians in the fifth chapter verse seven he said you did run well who or what did hinder you that you should not obey the truth this persuasion cometh not from him that calleth you a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump just a little here and a little there, and we end up back out there. Just a little slacking up. That's all it takes, friends. I've done seen it too many times. Galatians 2 and 11. He says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to, his, to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. In other words, the Jew. <clears throat> See, it's one thing around the Jews and another around the Gentiles. Some people are the one thing around church people and then on Sunday and then next day, Monday, there's something different. That's what Peter was, and Paul is addressing Peter to his face. Verse 13, it says, and the other Jews disassembled likewise. They begin to follow and do as, as Peter did. The ones that had come out of Judaism and, and out of the Mosaic Law into the New Testament, they are following Peter back to do the old things again. And so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Dissimulation is acting under a feigned or fake part. In other words, a hypocrite. What is a hypocrite? It's somebody that's not themselves on Sunday. <laughs> I used to ask Brother Jerry that. I said, Brother Jerry, what's a hypocrite? He had, he had shouted out, somebody that's not themselves on Sunday. Verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel... I said to Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, or you could liken it like this, if you, you know, being a Jew living and you a sinner, and you came over and you started being a Christian, why are you falling back to the old ways? If you say you're a Christian, why are you doing the things that the world do it? Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, but by the works. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. From Genesis to Malachi, I can't go to heaven. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, while we say that we're Christians, while we have, have been born again, we ourselves are also found sinners is therefore Christ the minister of sin? And he answers, he said, God forbid. For if I build the things which I 
destroyed, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? Transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, I live like Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. That word frustrate means to set aside, to violate, to cast off, to regard, have a low regard of. He says, I don't have a low regard of the grace of God. I don't just take for granted this grace of God, but I secure it in my life and I hold it dearly. If righteousness come from the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you most of all for who you are. Thank you for an opportunity to be in the house of the living God in your presence. Father, help us all, Lord, to not think of the person beside us today, but help us to take this word and apply it unto our own individual life, Lord. Examine our own selves, Lord, whether we're in the faith or not, whether we are keeping you number one. And Father, we just give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Peter was one thing on Sunday and something else on Monday, like so many people. Amen? Peter struggled with that in his life, and we see that. Even though I believe he overcame, I believe he he came to the realization that he has to get serious with God, quit playing around. We see that with Peter. On Sunday, he was with Jesus. And he says to Jesus, he says, when Jesus looked at him and said, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. And Peter looked at him and says, I'll go with you to prison and to death. That's Sunday talk. I'll do a great work for God. I'm going to sell out for God. I'll go to prison and to death for you. But Monday came and he's around the fire. And they said, hey, we saw you with Jesus. He said, I know not the man. I don't know him. Don't know him. That's something totally different, isn't it? One thing on Sunday, one thing on Monday. We can't be that way. Are you with me this morning? Are you with me? Peter, like so many, was easily swayed one way or another at times. And the danger of that is that he swayed others with him when he did. See, that's the danger. That's why the Lord said in Revelation to the ladies in church, he said, I would just hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, you lead too many people in the wrong direction. I want you hot for God or out there at a rank center just doing all the sin you can. He said, but when you've when you got one foot in, one foot out, and you're leading other people in the wrong way, that's dangerous. And that's what Peter was doing. Peter was influencing others in the wrong way. In fact, he said in John in the 21st chapter in verse number three, Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. And what happened? What happened? And they say unto him, we also go with thee. We're following you. There's people that will follow us and we need to make sure that we're traveling in the right way. Amen. Are y'all with me this morning? Don't make me come out there. I can I got a belt. I ain't going to use it though. Y'all might take it away and use it on me. <laughs> Amen. But you understand what I'm saying. He says, we go with you. They went forth and entered to the ship immediately. And that night they caught, say it, nothing. We're going in circles. Are we going in circles? Or are we, we going somewhere? Help us, Lord. We understand that Jesus is at the bank and he cried out to him and he said, children, have you any meat? 
And they said, no. I can imagine. Been out there all night long and caught nothing. And somebody says, you, you catch anything? You want to say, no, I ain't catch a thing. They're all not irritable. How many of you have been out fishing all night and ain't caught nothing? You're irritable. Uh, you're tired, worn out. What a wasted trip. You're irritable. You come home and the wife says anything to you, you want to jump all over her. Uh, amen? Because you're irritable. I, I can imagine. No! He said, cast on the right side and you'll find. In other words, do it God's way. Do it the right way. We need to live our life God's way, the right way. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Right. Hallelujah. Awesome is our God to us. He said in Luke, the 11th chapter, in verse number 30, he said, For as Jonah was assigned unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be unto this generation. The Queen of the South, which was Queen of Sheba, that came to Solomon, because she had heard how great this man was and and she traveled so far with great riches and brought it to this king. He said, the king, queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. She came from so far away. It was a costly trip and it cost her so much. And she'll say, you had a greater in your presence, in your life. You had a greater opportunity and you blew it over the trinkets of the world, over the enticements of the world, of these other things that distracts us from doing what God has called us to do. Are you with me? Yes. Luke. 32, it says, And the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment of the generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here, Jesus Christ. You see, the people of Nineveh, they, they stood up, they followed, they obeyed what Jonah had said. And a greater than Jonah is here, and we disobey him. We don't follow the Lord. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it under uh, put it in a secret place. Does anybody take their calling and hide it away? That's what he's saying. You don't light a, a candle and you put it under a bushel somewhere. You light, it for, you light it for a purpose to give light to others. And that's what the Lord does to me and you. And he puts us up there to display us to bring light into a lost and dying world. And what are we doing with it? What are we doing, he says? Neither under a bushel but on a candlestick that they which come may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye or thy interest or whatever the treasure in our life is, thy whole body also is full of that treasure of that, of that interest. But when thine eye is evil, divided, or, or not interested, he says, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Don't fool yourself. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no, dark, no part of dark, he said, the whole shall be full of light. That's why he tells us not to have any, anything to do. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Darkness has no place with the light. But it's when the bright shining of the candle doth give light. You see, even sinners can spot hypocrisy. A hypocrite, a sinner can. You know, sinners joke about church people. Do y'all know that? Because they see them out there one day, they're preaching to them, and the next day they're out there doing something totally opposite of what they preach. It's a joke to the world. They laugh at it. I've told you many times I'd walk into the pot line shift supervisor's office and there'd be several pot line supervisors in there. I was a supervisor in another department. I walk in and, and they, they knew I was a preacher they, and they'd jump and they start and they'd say, hey, there comes old Swagger. There comes old PTL, past the lady, past the loot, back in Jim Baker's day. That's all right. That's all right. I can take it, Amen. Huh? 
I know that by, by, by the grace of God, I could be a Jimmy Swagger, and I could be a, a, a Jim Baker, amen, but by the grace of God, and I've held on to it, and I've stayed faithful, amen. Yeah. They got their eyes somewhere it shouldn't be, and their interest was something else. I preached a message one time, lizard Christians. <laughs> you ever seen a lizard? He's on a green plant, he's green. He jumps over on the brown piece of wood, he turns brown. That's amazing, isn't it? How they do that? <laughs> How they do that? Well, I ask the same thing about Christian people. They're one thing on Sunday and there's something else next week. How'd they do that? <laughs> I ain't never figured out how to do that. My conscience won't let me do that. Amen? You see, that's God put a conscience in every one of us and he works with us through our conscience. And when you do wrong, God takes his fingers. A lot of people say he takes his belt and beats you. No, he takes his finger and touches your conscience. Amen? But the thing about it, he says that there in Timothy, he says, now the Spirit speaketh especially in the fourth chapter. In verse one, he says, then in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil and having their, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They do things wrong and don't feel nothing wrong about it. It's a well, ain't done. I don't feel no conviction. Yeah, because your conscience is seared. Are you with me? Matthew 5 and 13, it says, You're the salt of the earth. Friends, if 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 we don't preserve the earth, who in the world will? Who will? If we don't preach the gospel, who will? If we don't stand for Christ, who will? He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its savor, has lost its flavor, its character, its effectiveness, wherewith shall it be salted? It is since for good for nothing but to be cast out, trodden under the foot of men. I, I was talking to a young man this week, and he pastors a, told me he pastors a church. And I said, well, where are you pastoring? He told me. I knew exactly where he was at. I knew someone that used to go there, part of Sister Connie's family. And I knew the pastor that was there then. And you heard it back several years ago. He'd go down, this pastor would go down and pick up prostitutes and carry them back to an old trailer behind the church there and have, their, have his day with them. And I said, yeah, I, I know about that. And I said, that's the church, that pastor. But see, uh, that would be a hot, I would hate to pastor that church. I think I'd just board the doors up on it. Tear it down, build another one or something. How do you overcome that? How, 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 how do you, I need you to come to this church here. I, I want to invite you to come to church. They say, oh, yeah, that's where that pastor was carrying prostitutes in the back where I've been having time with them. Several different ones. He's in prison now. How do you overcome that? If salt loses its savor, how are you going to get it back? How do you get it back? So I would need to count the cost. Verse 14, it says, You're the light of the world. Y'all for quiet on me this morning. I know what it is. Brother Carl told me the secret. He said, In the worship service, you deliver the meat of the word. He said, in Sunday school, I'm giving them dessert back there. And they get full on dessert and them sweets. And they come out here and they half sleep. <laughs> they ain't hungry. They just play with the food. Is that what it is? He said, we got it backwards. We need to have a worship service first and then Sunday school. <laughs> have the dessert last. <laughs> Are y'all with me? You're the light of the world. The city is set on a hill. We're the light. We're the hope of the world. Neither do men light a candle, put it on a bushel, but on the candlestick, it giveth light unto all that is in the house. Who are we giving light to? Think about it. Who's watching us? Who's watching you? Who's watching you? How many realize that somebody is watching you? If nothing else, the Lord is. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. We have a responsibility to others. We're our brother's keeper. We're to let the light of the Lord shine through us at all times that they see 
our light and glorify Father in heaven. Amen? He, Ephesians 5 and 8, he says, but ye were sometime darkness, but now are ye light of the world. Walk as children of the light. Walk as Christians walk. Philippians uh, 2 and 15, he says, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Don't let it pervert you among whom we shine as lights in the world. Amen. First Peter 2 and 9, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that had called you out of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. Oh, you're so wonderful to us, Lord. Matthew 16 chapter, Jesus as his disciples said, who do men say I am? Who do men say that I am? We know what this is. Some said Jeremiah, Isaiah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. And they said, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, you know, Jesus commended him for that. Talked about building his church. But I want to ask a question here to us. Who do men say that we are? Who do men say that you are, Brother Donald? Brother Jason, who do men say you are? Brother George, who do men say that you are? Brother Dewey, who do men say? Brother Woody, Sister Betty, Sister Francis, Sister Jean. Bubba, who do men say that you are? Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can pick old Bubba. I love Bubba. Don't y'all? <laughs> Amen. Bubba's a good fella. Hard worker. Amen. Y'all say a prayer for, for his wife sitting next to him. <laughs> and Ryan has to work with him every day. <laughs> See him sitting over in that chair. <laughs> no, I just kid. <laughs> God's good, isn't he? I mean, but think about it. Who, who's our co-workers say that we are? Who's our neighbors say we are? Who's our family? Amen. Who do men say that I am? That's pretty bold, Jesus, say that, huh? Who do men say that I am? <laughs> don't, don't answer that. <laughs> wow. Pretty awesome, I think. <sighs> Who do men say? You know, everybody has things synonymous with their name. Everybody. It's a synonym of your name. Synonymous with a name. When I say a name like Billy Graham, what's the first thing that pops to your mind? Amen. Well, if I say this name Charles, and this is for the older people, Charles Matson, what comes to your mind? It's, it's something synonymous with every name. If I say your name, what? What would be synonymous with your name? What about Benedict Arnold? Traitor. He was in the, under George Washington, he was a, a leader in the American army. He switched sides, went over to the British side, traded sides. That was a wrong decision. <laughs> Amen. What about Absalom? Y'all know Absalom in the Bible? What comes to your mind, Sister Connie, when you say Absalom? Stole the, Stole the hearts of the people. He was all things to everybody. <laughs> God. Uh, he's all things to everybody. He told everybody just what they need to hear. <laughs> Amen? Stole their hearts. Tried to take over the kingdom from David. Stole their hearts. Absalom. I mean, every name is... Synonymous. What about Judas? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say Judas? Not many people name their sons Judas, do they? I'm sure there's someone in this world, but look at the one next to you and say, what do men think? What is synonymous with call their name? What's synonymous with Connie? Tammy? What's synonymous with your name? What you think? 
What did they say back? Some of y'all give me an answer. What did they say back? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, ain't God good to us? Y'all get the drift. Y'all get what we're talking about here this morning. What the Lord is saying to us, right? Everybody has an opinion of us. Look in the 14th chapter, verse 28, he says, Which of you intended to build a tower? Sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he has sufficient to finish it. As, a, as an old house used to be on Old Dairy, old dairy Road, and for 20 years, 25 years, I'd passed by it. Stayed the same. He built it so far, just dried it, kind of dried it in on the outside and just sat there. 25 years, 20 years, yeah. And I preached on it several times. I said, it's like, and I'd bring that scripture. And I said, uh, it's a house up on Old Dairy Road. And, and, and the guy started it, and it's just there, and it's just, and he's had to go back and replace little rotten stuff on the outside of it. It keeps, you know, and, and it's just never going to finish it, don't look like. I said, it reminds me of a lot of Christians. They start a race, they don't finish it. And I brought up several times that one of the sisters of the church stopped by there one day. We saw him out there in the yard, just happened there, because I'd never see anybody out there, you know. And she did. And she said, you know, my pastor preached about you in this house. <laughs> but you know what? It must have shook him. He finished it. He finished it. I mean, just seemed like overnight. It must have woke him up. And maybe this morning, it might be some of us in here today that, that God is shaking. He said, wake up. The title of what we're talking about is to be a shiner. It goes along with Vacation Bible School. Be a shiner. That's what the title of this message is, be a shiner. When y'all see it on Facebook, that's what the title will be, be a shiner. It's amazing, isn't it? Luke 14 and 34, he says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its savor, where would shall it be salted? Where is it, where's it going to get it from? See, Samson thought he could just shake himself and, and everything would be a new again. Only he didn't. His strength didn't come back. He didn't know that the Lord departed. It's a dangerous place to be. Of course, the happy ended. I brought it in last Sunday. You know, he prayed and repented and God gave him strength. Of course, he died through that but those coming in from 1 Corinthians 9 and 24 he says know ye not that they which run in a race run how much with all your heart soul to mind anything worth doing is worth doing right but one receiveth the prize which one is that the one that wins so run run so run that you may obtain and every, one, every man that striveth for the mastery, that's command of a situation, is temperate, he's self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Other so fall, uh, so run, Paul said, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I don't just talk the talk, I walk the walk, is what Paul is saying. I ain't beating my gums, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm glad that he did it too. Verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, least by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway, unapproved, rejected. In other words, this flesh could care less if you go to church, if you do your calling, it could care less. If I got up and, and studied yesterday morning and got this message, I could, he, flesh could care less. It won't lay in the bed. I had to drag, kick, and snort and drag it out of that bed. No, I didn't. I jumped right up. I knew what I was fixing to do. Amen? Study this word. And my body knew. I got it in a habit. It knows what to do. Amen? On Saturday morning, most all the time. Occasionally, I might do it on Friday night, but most all the time, 99% of the time, Sunday, Saturday morning, I'm in there. Amen? Getting prepared. And the body knows it. It's my transportation get around, buddy. You get up and get in there. Amen? God's awesome to us. In closing, Luke 14 and 26. Jesus talking here. He said, if any man come to me 
and hate not his father. What? We got to hate our daddy? In comparison to our love for God, it's as if we hate them. That's how much superior our love for God should be. But when we love God that way, then our father, we love him with a greater love than we ever loved him. And these others here. Hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brother. I remember the day I got saved over in Commerce, Georgia on the way home. I looked over at Connie and I said, I thought I loved you. It's a different love. Can I get a witness? It's a different love. It's an agape love. Hallelujah. He says, Yea, in his own life, his own will, his own pleasures, his own interest. If you don't hate all that in comparison to me, he cannot be my disciple. He said, I got to be first. I'm a jealous God. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, his calling, his purpose, first, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Don't need him. Verse 38, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I can't use you. I can't use part-timers. God has no, you know, like the police force has undercover cops. God has no undercover Christians. No secret service in the kingdom of God. He expects 100% loyalty and first and in all of our lives and everything we have. That's why he says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you of life. How many believe that this morning? The Lord is saying all or none. I want total loyalty to our calling. I don't want to get there and hear them words Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He said, but wait, wait a minute. We, we preached in your street. We, we did all these other things. <clears throat> he said, I never knew you. Didn't know you. Something to think about, isn't it? Peter said, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where does the sinner and ungodly going to appear? Ah, oh, help us, Lord. I believe and I'm persuaded in here that every one of us in here wants to do our very best we can for God. We want to be an able Christian, not a Cain Christian. An able brings his very best and offers it to the Lord. Amen. You know what your very best is today? Is you are your very best. I want to ask you to stand and when you do this morning, I want you to I want you to think about who do men say that you are. Maybe, maybe we need to ask ourselves, who am I? That's what Moses said. Who, who am I? Who am I, Lord? Search me, help me, Lord. Put you number one. Are you ready? Are you ready this morning? If the Lord spoke to you somehow in this service, obey Him today. He loves you and you love Him. Get back in that good relationship. Are you ready? Here we go on three. Stand one, two, three. Stand all over.